Okay, it's recording. So um, I guess I'll record it and like post it on YouTube. I don't really know. I, I to be honest, I have no idea. Like I've never done this, so <laughs> fun. Um, we always get to learn something new. Cool? Okay, any questions? No? Okay. Let's talk about post-classic Mesoamerica. Ooh. So um, last class we were talking about some of the major Maya sites. Um, and we looked at, we watched a video about Palenque. Um, we looked at the tomb of Lord Pakal and we looked at the cover of the sarcophagus and we saw a depiction of Lord Pakal sort of like in between two worlds, in between the heavenly world and the underworld. Um, and we saw along the edges of that sarcophagus um, a list of all of the ancestors of Lord Pakal going back six generations. So we know that family and lineage is really important in Maya culture. Um, this is how like power and legitimacy was passed down over the years. Um, and then um, hopefully you briefly studied on your own um, the sites Tikal in modern day Guatemala and Uxmal in the Yucatan Peninsula um, of Mexico. So hopefully you looked at those on your own. Did you? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, the discussion topic is my only question. Okay, I'll tell you about that later. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about post-classic Mesoamerica. So what's happening in the post-classic period? Um, and this is generally the period from around 900 to 1521. And you know why we use 1521? You could talk. Why? <laughs> No, you're supposed to know. Tell me. <laughs> Somebody knows. Is it after the Olmec? Why are we using 1521 as the end of the post-classic period? What happens in 1521? Something in there. The Europeans, they're, they come and they come. Thank you. Somebody who is awake and alive today. Marissa. 1521 is when Tenochtitlan falls to the Spaniards. Yes? I know I told you you don't have to memorize dates, but you have to know this date. This is like a world shattering event, right? Like indigenous populations are toppled by Europeans and like the world changes forever um, in 1521. So you need to know this date. Okay. So I wrote it down here. I wrote it down. I just couldn't read what I wrote. <laughs> I wrote it down like, but how do I pronounce that? <laughs> Tenochtitlan. Well, okay. you could say the Aztec capital. Oh, okay. I'll write that down. 1521 is when the Aztec capital is like officially falls to the Spaniards. So this is the time. So we're approaching the Aztec empire. This is the time period we're talking about. We're looking at what happens um, after um, power is dispersed um, in the classic period. So basically, um, and we're, we're, as we're looking at this history, we're looking at how power is centralized and then is dispersed and centralized and dispersed, right? So there are these like great cities that rise up and then they collapse um, and power spreads out and then great cities rise up again and then they collapse. Um, so we're talking about now another moment of sort of like a collapse of these great cities cities um, before the rise of another great city, Tenochtitlan. So in the post-classic period, um, people are living in smaller groups. Um, areas of Mesoamerica are ruled by, uh, I would think of them as like lords as opposed to kings. So it's not one unified kingdom. Um, instead, we have like small groups of individuals um, who are led by a local leader, um, who's leading the local people. Um, and we have kind of the rise of palace culture. So uh, people are living in these, um, the royalty are living in these palaces. The people are living around um, in that area. Um, and then these, these royal members of the court would interact with each other through palace culture. So you can think of it sort of like 
I don't know, the Knights of the Round Table or something like, you know, where their power is um, spread out um, amongst various lords and nobility. And as they're visiting each other at these courts, they have big feasts, they have dinner parties, um, and at these parties, uh, there will be sort of ways that power is reinforced. And a lot of this happens through um, what we might call storytelling or the oral tradition. So this becomes really important in the post-classic period, the oral tradition. Um, so there would be somebody at the court who would tell a story um, and they would hold up these codices, which are ancient books, right? This codex is sort of a fancy word for an ancient book. Um, and they would hold up this codex um, and show the images and an orator, somebody who's speaking, um, would tell a story. And it might be the story of the power of one ruler, of the places that he's conquered, etc. Um, or it might be a story from mythology. Um, it might be some local history. So they're um, transmitting information to each other through these oral histories. Um, and this is something that like Western Europe didn't really kind of understand. Um, a lot of like Western Europeans arrived and thought, well, they don't have sort of writing how we think of writing. Um, and, you know, somehow that means that they are not recording their histories, which is actually the opposite of true. We know that the indigenous people um, had a writing system, and we've talked about this before in class. The writing system is a glyphic writing system. It's a visual writing system. So um, you'll see images like this, um, and these glyphs and symbols stand in for words. Um, so it's not that there is no literature, um, it's that the language is, just looks a little, a little bit different from European languages. Uh, okay, so I brought a couple books to show you today. Um, and like, um, I have some other books that I wanna show you, but um, they're in my office at work, so I have to sneak onto campus to try to go get them or maybe try to convince a security guard to um, let me go into my office and get some books. Um, so I will do that at some point over the next week, but I wanna show you some books in case you're interested in this topic uh, and you wanna research this topic for your final project. I do have books that I am willing to lend out to you. If you need them, I can like, put them on my doorstep and you can pick them up from six feet away if you want. So let me show you the books. Um, the first book I wanna show you um, is uh, a story, it's a, a book that's written about the Codex Nuttall. So we'll look at the Codex Nuttall um, today in class. Um, it's a text written about that Codex. Um, the other book, and it's called Lord Eight Wind of Suchitlan and the Heroes of Ancient Oaxaca. So it's specifically about rulers and powerful warriors in the state specifically of Oaxaca. Um, so this is from like the area of Mixtec studies. Um, the next book I want to show you is Writing Without Words, Alternative Literacies in Mesoamerica and the Andes. Um, and this book talks about writing. Uh, in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. And it looks both at Mesoamerica, Mexico, and the Andean region, so like where the Inca people live. So this could be an area that you study, um, again, if you want to do something like this for your final project. Um, and the last book um, that I have to show you uh, is a, a history book. It's called The Mixtecs of Colonial Oaxaca. This is written by one of my um, advisors in grad school at UCLA, uh, and he's a historian, uh, Kevin Tarasiano, and he's an expert on colonial Oaxacan history. So this is about colonial history from the 16th to the 18th century. So this is like what happens in Oaxaca after Europeans arrive. Um, and Oaxaca is generally like less studied than other parts of Me Mesoamerica because of course the capital when Europeans arrived was in Mexico City, Tenochtitlan. So Oaxaca was like outside of the capital. And so it's a less studied area. So if you do like this stuff and you wanna learn more about it, um, Oaxacan studies is like a really good area to, to go into because there's lots that needs to be done. Okay, so those books are available. Um, once you start thinking about your group project, um, I'll have like a whole library of books um, that I can offer you um, to support you as you work on your collaborative project. Cool? Thank you. Okay, 
So, uh, I wish I could turn off that. I don't know how to do that. Um, I'm turning into my mom. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's talk about the post-classic period. So, like I mentioned, we're looking at this time period from 900 to 1521. 1521, of course, is when the Spaniards officially take over and declare that Tenochtitlan belongs to Spain, um, and they rename it New Spain. I do want to point out that in the 16th century, so in the 1500s and well into the 1600s, about until about 1700, there were lots of uh, indigenous rebellions. Um, so yes, the Spaniards took over in 1521, but people rebelled for like over 100 years after that. Um, okay, so the other thing that I want to point out is that as these great cities fall and people disperse, we have these smaller sites rising to power um, and vying with each other for power or sometimes allying and making alliances. So in the codices, we have lots of stories about battles, but we also have stories about alliances no, that no, are no, built. That's okay. Um, then, as we move forward through the post-classic period, um, we will see that the rise of the Mexica people and the rise of the Aztec Empire, right? So power is dispersed and then reconsolidates under the Aztec Empire. The Aztec Empire is led by one king who manages the, the whole area of the empire. So it's, it's a different moment. So we'll talk about that probably next week. Okay, so um, this week, what else are we going to look at? Um, so we'll look at the rise of these great houses. Um, because these great houses rise, we'll see the production of codices or books. Um, we'll also see in the post-classic period, the introduction of um, metalsmith, smelting gold, silver, and copper. This is introduced from South America through Central America. Um, the Southern America, like, uh, people in the Andean region were working gold at a much earlier rate than people in Mesoamerica and that traveled north into Mexico um, during this time period and the Mixtec people of Oaxaca are known in the in the post-classic period as like the great metalsmiths of Mesoamerica. We also see um, the trade of turquoise from uh, the U.S. Um, southwest um, and uh, rare and exotic flowers from the tropical areas. Um, so there's lots of trade going on. Um, it's just sort of happening um, at a less centralized level. Um, what else do we see? We also see late in the post-classic period under the Aztec Empire, the development of chinampas, which are um, human-made lakes for um, agriculture. And I'll talk about that. Um, later when we get to the Aztec Empire. Um, I also mentioned this idea of great houses. So these are the political changes in post-classic period that there are these great houses that rise to power. Um, so again, power is dispersed um, and people are trying to form alliances with each other. So this is really happening in the courts. Um, and we'll look at some of the art associated with courtly life in um, Mesoamerica. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm not going to look at everything really closely. I'm going to kind of move through the slideshow. I want you to read it um, on your own. Um, one site I want to show you is Kakashla because there are some really uh, amazing murals at Kakashla. And Kakashla is a great site because it kind of explains what life was like in the post-classic period. If you look at this site, um, what you'll see is like a palace you can see right here on the North Plaza Palace, and then you can see a sunken courtyard. Uh, and we kind of saw the same thing um, in the Maya sites, right? Do you remember Palenque? We saw this kind of sunken courtyard in the palace. Um, so these really come to replace um, sort of large ceremonial centers. Um, the pyramid that's associated with Kakashla, where people would go to worship, is actually one kilometer away from the archaeological site of Kakashla. So um, whereas like when we look at Teotihuacan, Montelban, some of these um, other sites, pre-classic sites, earlier sites, we see like pyramids, like the elite people living at the same place as the religious centers. In the post-classic period, we see kind of a separation, almost as if there's like a separation between church and state. 
um, which is something that you know we see in other parts of the world, um, maybe in these years. Um, okay, so another thing I want to point out is Kakashla. If you look at the image here um, on the map, is um, kind of out like outside of Mexico City. So up here we have Teotihuacan and Kakashla is down here. And if you keep going um, east, you would get to the Maya region. So Kakashla, we see influences of both Teotihuacan art style and Maya art style, um, and specifically in the murals. Uh, so I wanna show you um, the murals. Okay, so this is the site of Kakashla. You can see that it's like out in the countryside in Mexico. And in fact, when I went there, um, I got lost like a million times on the way there because it's kind of like out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but you can see that it's up on a hill. So can you, it's kind of hard to tell, but can you see this terraced farmland that it's up on a hill? And then you can see this thing covering it, this roof. That, that's built in the modern period um, to protect the, the site from sunlight. Yeah? Uh, okay. Um, and as I mentioned, sort of like the religious areas are sort of away from the palace itself. So this is as you're coming. So you go to the pyramid like, you know, half a mile away and then you keep going along this road and you get to the archaeological site. So this is the palace um, up on a hill. Um, and this is, these are images from the archaeological site and it's, you can't really tell in this photograph, so I'm going to show you some better images, but this whole area on the bottom part of the palace um, is covered in a really interesting mural. Um, this is um, the battle mural and we see basically like warriors dressed up in different attires, some warriors dressed as jaguars and some warriors dressed as eagles um, fighting a battle. So I'll show you some images. Um, I think you can kind of make it out. What you see here um, is the foundation. This is the foundation of the building. So the tops of the buildings are gone, but you can see the pillars here and you can see the murals. And then this is that sunken courtyard. This site is a really interesting site because it wasn't excavated until the 1980s, which I know some of you were like, I was born in the 90s or whatever, but like 1980s is not that long ago. It's really not that long ago. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done um, at this site in terms of like what archeologists and art historians can do. Okay, I wanna show you the battle mural. So here's a little bit of a closer view so you can see that this whole area is painted. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we see basically um, two sets of warriors. We see some warriors dressed up wearing jaguar costumes. So you can see this figure right here with the jaguar skin um, kind of on his, uh, as a shirt. Um, and then another set of warriors wearing feathered headdress um, or wearing feathers. So again, here's a jaguar warrior and here's a feathered headdress warrior. And who's winning? Can you tell? The jaguar? Someone standing? Yeah. yeah, it looks like the jaguar warriors are winning, right? So you can see um, the figures wearing the jaguar costumes appear to be dominating um, the eagle warriors. The eagle warriors um, look like they're down on the ground. Um, they are, in some cases, stripped of their clothing. Um, and unarmed. You can see this figure right here. So here's the face. Can you see that? There's the face. Here's the torso. Here's an arm. And can you see this right here? Can you see where my cursor is moving? Yes. Yes. Okay. So right here you see um, a wound and you, can you see blood dripping out of it? Yeah. So this guy is actually dripping blood from all over his body. There's another figure over here dripping with blood. Um, and you can see that they're being dominated um, by these jaguar warriors. So it appears that this depicts, you know, two warring factions, um, two, you know, armies who are fighting. Um, and in this case, the jaguar warriors have won. 
Uh, a lot of archaeologists look at the battle mural from Kakashla um, and say that we can really see the influence of Maya murals. So I know we didn't talk much about them, um, but if you study Maya murals, you'll notice um, this blue color. This is a recreation. You'll notice this blue color that's really prominent in the background of Maya murals. And you see that same kind of Maya blue used also at Kakashla. Um, so for a long time, a lot of scholars talked about sort of like the strong Maya presence at Kakashla. Um, but if you look closely, you'll also see some influence of Teotihuacan. Um, so if you go into um, another room also at Kakashla, and then let me go to the um, map so you see where we're going. So the battle mural is on this building right here. Um, and then if you go over here to the star chamber, um, you'll see these painted pillars um, with these two figures who are wearing jaguar skins um, and they're sort of anthropomorphic like they kind of look like humans because they're standing on two legs um, but they're also blue so like not very human um, and this one has a really long scorpion tail um, so there seems to be maybe like um, a male figure and a female figure um, and these might be sort of like early, oh my gosh, I touched my face. Um, these might be sort of like early depictions of what we later see in Aztec mythology of these defeated gods who've been cast out um, of the skies. Uh, let me show you some more imagery from Kakashla. I'm going to show you close ups of these paintings. Um, so, again, you can see these are on like a um, flanking an entrance to a smaller chamber. Um, and so you can see these images right here. This is at the archaeological site. And I'm going to show you um, some more um, close up images. So here we see a figure dressed in a jaguar costume. So can you see the head inside there? So it looks like a human wearing this kind of jaguar skin costume. Um, and then standing on what looks like, I don't know, like a snake, like a jaguar snake, kind of. Um, so we kind of see the jaguar spotted snake kind of figure. And then all of this um, imagery in here, we see like turtles and snails and shells um, and kind of water creatures like hermit crabs and references to water. Um, and then you can see some imagery here that look like glyphs. Um, and so when we, when art, art historians look at these glyphs, we're not exactly sure what they represent, um, but we do see, especially looking at this one here um, on the Jaguar priest, uh, that show the influence of Teotihuacan art styles. And I'll show you some more later. Um, but anyway, these two figures that we see, um, we think that they're probably priests. They look like humans wearing costumes. Um, perhaps costumes associated with some kind of deity. Um, and one is wearing this kind of jaguar costume and then the other one is wearing this kind of feathery costume. So here's the jaguar and we, we call this a priest because we think it's like somebody dressed up as a deity. Um, and here's the bird man. So you can see that he's got these like feathered kind of back um, thing that he's wearing and then also with a bird headdress um, and then what's he's and then look at his legs I don't know if he has like weird um, shoes on um, but it looks like he has these kind of like bird feet I think he's wearing like bird feet like shoes like a costume um, and then he's standing on what's that uh, alligator it kind of looks like an alligator or a bird like a phoenix or something a, a deity that we have seen at Teotihuacan anybody uh, um, the one that was in the statue yeah my boy Quetzal okay somebody somebody responded yes the feathered <laughs> serpent and in fact, speaking of Quetzal, look at this. Doesn't that look like a Quetzal bird? It's got that like little body and then the really long tail. Can you see that? 
So that actually looks like the little Quetzal. Um, and then this long kind of snake body is covered with feathers. So we think this is maybe some kind of depiction of Quetzalcoatl, Quetzal, feather, Coatl, snake, feathered serpent. Yeah? Okay. Ooh, the long feathered tail. Yeah, on the Quetzal right there. Okay, um, in this image, so again, we see in terms of style, the influence of Maya um, murals. So definitely there's some contact with the Maya region, um, but we're still in central Mexico. So um, Cacaxla is really like an hour or so outside of Mexico City. Um, so we're still in that area where Teotihuacan had existed. Um, and there's something in this specific mural that reminded me when I saw this, of something that I saw at Teotihuacan. And it's this, see this kind of glyph up here with the hands going like this? Yeah? So if you look at um, a close up, you can see um, these kind of hands joining together. Uh, oh, and I got a lot of good close ups here of um, the feathered serpent for you. We actually, if we look at the murals at Teotihuacan, we see the use of hands, um, sometimes disembodied hands, um, all over Teotihuacan. So here's some murals from Teotihuacan, and here you can see these hands, these sort of disembodied hands. You can see the hands here. Even the murals that we looked at, remember the great goddess mural from Teotihuacan, where um, all of these seeds and water was coming out of hands? So hands really figure prominently in the murals at Teotihuacan. And if you look at Teotihuacan, we find similar glyphs using hands. So can you see these, this little one down on the left side um, that's labeled B? There's these hands and then all of this stuff is coming out of them like water and shells. You'll recognize this, I think, from um, the murals at Teotihuacan that we looked at of the great goddess. Um, and we see kind of the same thing happening here where the, there are like these disembodied hands. So maybe this is some kind of place glyph um, that's at least referencing stylistically Teotihuacan. So we see at Kakashla and other post-classic sites all of this cultural mixing. Like, we, we don't have in the post-classic period a purely Maya site. In fact, a lot of people talk about what's that really famous site in, um, in, in Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula, in Quintana Roo, where like everybody goes when they go to Cancun. Who goes to Cancun? When somebody goes to Cancun on vacation, which is the site that they go to? Anybody? What's that really famous Maya site? Oh, I told you all to mute yourselves, but now I want you to talk to me. I wouldn't know. Has anybody been to, has anybody been to Cancun ever? Yes, hello, yeah? it's really nice, yeah. Okay, so when you went to Cancun, what's like the archeological site that people tell you to go to? I like how everybody's like, nah, I'm poor. Oh, the archeological, oh, nah, I just like, nah. Just Tulum, Tulum is one of them. Oh, Tulum, and okay. Chichen Itza! Okay. Okay, I've gone to I've, okay, I've gone to both sides actually though. Chich yeah, okay. Thank, thanks, Victor, who's been there and can't even answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> my bad, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, yes, Chichen Itza. So Chichen Itza is that really, really famous, well-known archaeological site that like that's yeah. the one that everybody knows. Even if they don't know anything about Mesoamerica, they know Chichen Itza, right? Yeah. That I've site, a lot of people talk about that site as a Maya site, but it's really not a Maya site. It's a Maya Toltec site. There are Maya people living in that region that get conquered by the Toltec people. And that site really is a mixing of two different cultures. And this is what we see in the post-classic period, a mixing of all these different cultures. And we see the same thing at this site that I'm talking about right now, Kakashla, a mixing of Maya culture and Teotihuacano culture. Um, so in the art, in the way people live, we're, we're going to see a lot of cultural mixing. So we don't have any like pure kind of sites in the post-classic period. Instead, like every place has some kind of relationship to another place. I mean, I think this is what makes the post-classic period kind of interesting. Um, and there are like a lot of, there's like a lot of spreading of art styles throughout post-classic um, Mesoamerica uh, because of this. Okay, so this is one of the points that I wanted to make that Kakashla, like Chichen Itza and so many other sites um, represents really like kind of 
a coming together of different cultural traditions. By the way, um, quick question. In Chichen Itza and like a lot of places are like in Tulum, and I think in Teotihuacan as well, if you clap like in the in the ball games, like um, arenas, just just gonna be like a noise of like a what do you call an it? echo. It, yeah, it's not. It's, it is an echo, but it's like oh, what was the name of like this animal? What's it called? Oh, it sounds like an animal. Yeah. It's like a seal or something. I forgot. It's like. Yeah, there's like, I mean, like, there are like all sorts of, um, there's like a whole study you could do about like sound at Mesoamerican pre-Columbian sites, like how sound was used, how sculptures, I mean, we saw sculpture, remember we went to VPAM and we saw sculptures of whistles? Anybody remember that? At the Vincent Price Art Museum at East LA College, we saw these little sculptures of whistles. Yeah. So, yeah, do you remember that? Yeah. So whistles are used, flutes are used, um, clapping, drums, like music is um, definitely something that activates these ceremonial sites. So we look at them and we just see sort of like crumbling stones, but you have to think of these sites as really being brought to life by other art forms. The visual, sound, music, singing, poetry, people reciting stories, like they really were like, alive and vibrant and music is like definitely and sound is definitely like engineered into the design of um, some of these sites. Okay, one more thing I want to show you at Kakashla before I talk about the Mishtek codices. I love this room at Kakashla. Um, so this is the red temple mural um, and you can see that it's um, built, um, it's painted along a staircase. Can you see that? Um, and the staircase leads into like the governor's room. Um, but we see some really interesting imagery. So I'm gonna show you, this is the original. What you're looking at is the original. So you can see that the bottom half of the mural um, is all that remains. Um, but I wanna show you um, a couple more images. Uh, and then I also have a re re reconstruction. What we see here is a figure standing in profile and it's kind of hard to see, but behind the figure is, a really interesting thing. It's kind of like a backpack. So this is all the stuff that like somebody would be a traveling salesman who would be probably Maya because the Maya were known for this, traveling around trading objects. So can you identify any of the things in his backpack? Right here. A reed, yeah. Feathers, yes. So can you see these blue things right here? These are feathers. I don't know what else this, this looks maybe like some kind of mask. So he's- it Looks like a hat. Like a hat or a headdress or a mask. So this figure is carrying objects that would be traded. So this is how these cultures were interacting with each other and sharing ideas and art styles and religious beliefs through trade. Um, so these Maya merchants were known as these travelers that would go throughout Mesoamerica and trade feathers for turquoise and etc. cetera. Um, and this is really how culture was like sort of spread during this time. So it's a really interesting depiction of something um, that we don't really see depicted anywhere else um, visually in this way. Um, and it's kind of cool to get to see like the backpack that, that he would carry um, on his travels. Um, the other thing that I want to point out to you is then there's a whole bunch of really weird imagery going on right here. Um, you can see some corn stalks. You can see what looks like water or a river kind of running down the staircase. And I'm going to show you a close up um, of some of this imagery. So here's the reconstruction in the museum on your left. And on your right um, is a detail from the original. Um, so you can see like a really weird kind of um, giant frog. You'll also see some more weird stuff. Do you see this thing? What is that? <laughs> it looks almost like a turtle too. Like yeah. <laughs> it's the jaguar turtle. <laughs> a jurdle. Jaguar. Jurdle. <laughs> a jagdle. Jardle. It's a turtle shape, but it's got like, it looks like it's jaguar. 
like kind of like spotted like a jaguar and like it looks like it has claws like a jaguar um you'll also notice in this very trippy mural the corn the cobs of corn which are heads i love how <laughs> jar turtle confirmed i love how everyone's like what the heck freaking out looking at this so this is like the corn on the cob right here these little pieces of corn those are heads do you love this trippy mural these guys were on some good stuff is correct i do think that there's some kind of hallucinogens involved in this like i don't know the people were eating some kind of mushrooms or flowers that were helping them see into the spiritual realm perhaps uh and you know depicting some really interesting imagery so we see this like kind of river flowing down here and then these weird like corn on the cob heads and weird jaguar turtles and all sorts of strange stuff we also see i like that somebody laughed at the spiritual realm that's that's really what we're talking about though um if you look at this ayahuasca is south american i don't think that they had ayahuasca but there are people in peru who use ayahuasca and historically have um, but, you know, there are different local plants and flowers in Mexico that people were surely consuming. No question. Surely. Like, of course. Um, okay, so do you see this kind of like star thing? Um, this, we're not exactly sure what this depiction references, but it might be um, a depiction of Venus um, or one of the planets. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, like, at certain times of the year, as soon as the sun sets and you um, see the moon rise, like you'll see Venus next to um, the moon. Um, so this might be a depiction of Venus um, or some kind of celestial being. Um, and then there's all this water, but then you can see that like next to the water, what do these look like? Feathers. So this looks like the body of the feathered serpent, um, almost like a giant river flowing on the back of the feathered serpent. I don't know, some kind of, some kind of trippy spiritual realm kind of stuff. Okay, um, so that's one other thing that I wanted to show you about Kakashla. It's one of my favorite things about Kakashla is like that really trippy um, red temple mural. Uh, okay, I want to show you just a few other sites in the post-classic period. Um, you probably have heard of the site of Tula, which is up here in the Valley of Mexico. Um, so Kakashla um, is kind of like over here, like sort of in between the Maya area and Teotihuacan, Kakashla is sort of over here. Um, now we're going back up north to Tula, um, which is a Toltec site. The Toltec people are kind of known throughout Mesoamerica as great warriors. Um, and they even have these giant sculptures of warriors that held up literally these sculptures held up the roof of the temple so you can see that here that hey, kind of, like, <laughs> you can see that like religion and um the military are sort of intertwined here right um so let me show you some more images of what this would have originally looked like okay so here's like pulling back out from the site so you can see this area right here with these pillars this would have been covered like with a roof um, and then you would go up the central staircase. You can see that these pyramids are smaller than some of the pyramids that we've been studying at Teotihuacan and in the Maya region, um, but they're much more elaborately decorated in some cases. And then you can see these um, pillars up here, and then there would have been like the roof of the temple um, above this. So let me show you an artist's rendering. Here's an artist's rendering. So here's the temple on top of the pyramid, and then these sculptures, um, these pillars of these warriors would like hold up the roof of the temple. And you can see in this artist's rendering um, that they would have originally been covered in paint. And I think you can sort of make out like what's going on um, by looking at the painted version. Um, you can see that they've got this kind of disc at the back, which is something that's typical that warriors would wear. You can see he has this like reed thrower thing in one hand. Um, and uh, if you look at the like sculptures themselves, you can see 
some of the traces of paint. They also have these like really elaborate hairdress, like headdresses um, that would be something that warriors would wear. And these are about 15 to 20 feet tall. So like really, really, really tall sculptures um, that are part of the architecture. So this is another post-classic site um, where the Tula, at Tula, where the Toltec people live. The Toltec people, as I mentioned earlier, come into the Maya region um, and basically conquer the Maya people who are living at the site of Chichen Itza. So let me show you some images of Chichen Itza. So this is Tula, this is the Toltec people, and they start moving around and conquering other sites and moving into the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and so Chichen Itza um, is really not a Maya site. It's a Toltec Maya site. Um, the Toltec culture has a really strong influence on Maya culture here in this part of the Maya world. Um, okay, so let me show you. Um, this is kind of like the layout, <clears throat> the site plan, um, and the really famous pyramid that everybody knows about is referred to as El Castillo, the, ca the castle in Spanish, right? Um, it was not a castle. It was a religious site. It's, it's a temple, right? Um, there's also a really huge ball court at Chichen Itza, yeah. um, a structure that was probably used as an observatory, um, and other such things. So here's the, um, at the top of the screen is El Castillo, the main pyramid. In the center of the screen is this kind of round structure, kind of shaped like a snail shell. This is the one known as the observatory. Great I have a question. Um, the way this pyramid was built, wasn't it like uh, like smaller pyramids before that, like mm -hmm. built on top of each other? Yes, this is a really good question. So, as archaeologists have been studying this site, they have found that like there were smaller versions of this temple, this pyramid inside this pyramid. Um, and this is something that we will see definitely in the Aztec region when we look at the Templo Mayor in Tenochtitlan. Um, we'll see that it was the same exact pyramid was built and rebuilt and rebuilt, um, you know, several different, like, I don't know, seven different times, several different times over like this period of hundreds of years. Yeah. So what you see is kind of like the final form, but originally it would, would have been smaller. Um, the one thing that like everybody like tells you when you go to Chichen Itza, which is a pretty cool thing, now on the spring equinox, um, the way the pyramid is built um, on the spring equinox, the sun casts a shadow on the side of the staircase and it makes it look like a serpent is slithering down the staircase. So I think I have a photograph um, in here, yeah. So this is the, on the spring equinox, the sun is shining and it, the way the sun hits like the edge of the pyramid with the alignment of the sun, it creates this kind of serpentine shadow. Can you see this black shadow going oh, down yeah, the side of the staircase? And then at the base of the staircase is a carved head of a serpent. Um, so it's, it's you know, yeah. it was obviously done on purpose, right? Like the sculpture was put there so that on this one day of the year, you would see this serpent, um, you know, sort of slithering down the staircase. Um, and so this is that really famous serpent shadow at Chichen Itza. So, you know, we have to remember that the indigenous people um, really understood things about um, the planets, the movement of the heavenly bodies, stars, astronomy, um, architecture, engineering, design, calendar system, cycles of time, like all this stuff that like me most modern people have forgotten. Um, so I think like this class and studying these things is like, a, you know, an attempt to try to recover some of this or remember these things um, <clears throat> that I think just, you know, civilizations have forgotten or that European civilizations destroyed when they came to um, what they called the new world. Here's a close up um, of that, um, the, the serpent heads at the base of um, the staircase at the pyramid El Castillo at Chichen Itza. 
Um, there's another temple that's really interesting at Chichen Itza that um, shows the influence of um, Toltec culture. This is the Temple of the Thousand Warriors. Um, so Toltec people kind of brought that warrior, warrior culture to the Maya region uh, and um, perhaps influenced um, the architecture with these kind of like um, columns or pillars um, that we see at Chichen Itza, maybe influenced um, from a site like Tula. Maybe originally these were painted or sculpted to look more like um, warriors. In fact, like this temple is called the Temple of a Thousand Warriors because of these pillars. Like they thought that they originally probably looked like this. Um, and then you'll see at the top, the entrance to the temple, mm -hmm. you'll see the same kind of structure that we saw at Tula. Um, and we'll see two snake heads. Um, there is a figure in the Maya region, Kukulkan, who is the equivalent or, you know, sort of um, similar figure to Quetzalcoatl or the feathered serpent. Yeah. Um, and then you'll also see the chalk mole, which is this um, figure right here who's kind of lying down um, and holding a little, like, tray. Do you um, feel like the heads of, like, the people, like, who would be sacrificed, like, right there? Yeah, so on the little tray thing, there would be like sacrificial offerings. Yeah. So sometimes the sacrificial offerings would be like a bird or a rabbit or like something like that, that you would kill on this stone and then burn incense. Um, it is true that sometimes there would be human sacrifice, but probably more rare than um, we think. Um, but yes, there, there would be some kind of sacrifice that would be placed on this tray. Um, the blood would be mixed in with the incense and the incense would be burnt and it would, the smoke would go up into the sky and the smoke would carry, um, the messages up to the heavens, up to the gods. Um, and this is important to remember because this chalk mole we see at, um, Toltec sites. Uh, and we're, we see it at Tula, the site we just looked at. Now we see it here at a Toltec Maya site, Chichen Itza. And I want you to remember it because next week when we talk about the Aztec, we'll see it again. Here are just a few um, more images from Chichen Itza. So you can see this kind of snake with feathers, um, you know, akin to Quetzalcoatl, feathered serpent, or um, as this figure is known in the Maya region, Kukulkan. It's basically the same deity. It's kind of like Tlaloc and Chak, right? The rain gods. There you can see the, um, the Chak mole right there in the center, which you also see at Tula. And later at the Templo Mayor, we will see this at the Aztec capital as well. <clears throat> um, there's also a huge gigantic ball court at Chichen Itza. So you can see in this photograph, like these, these are the size like that people are. So you can see like huge, huge sidewalls. Um, and there's a lot of sculpture um, on the ball court, um, on the sides of the ball court itself. So like, I don't know, compared to like Monte Alban, remember Monte Alban's like ball court was like so cute and charming and like this one's huge and massive. Um, but that tradition of playing the ball game is like throughout Mesoamerica. Um, you'll see it um, anywhere at any of these sites. Um, so here you can see all of the carvings on this side. Um, and then you can see the, um, the hoop that you would have to get the ball in is like impossibly high, like really, really high. I don't even know how anybody would get a ball up through there. It's almost like it's rigged. Um, this is one of um, the largest ball courts in Mesoamerica. So this is like a really unusual one. Um, oh, while I'm here, I wanna show you something that I want you to watch. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if you go uh, under the modules under pre-Columbian art, um, there's a section where it says um, Mesoamerican ball game. So you can click on that. Um, and there's a link to a website, which we'll see if I if it works for me, but basically it's a website that will tell you all about um, the Mesoamerican ball game. I don't know what's going on with my internet. 
it, it might be dying because like I'm using it too much. It's like an overloading. But anyway, there is a link. Um, so I want you to look at it. Um, it's mesoballgame.org. I could just try to type it. Oh, it's look, it's showing up. You see on El Dorado. What's that? Is the same ball game you see on El Dorado? Oh, El Dorado. Do you mean the Disney movie? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So basically, yes. Right. So that um, that movie, uh, like, is very problematic, but. Um, it does kind of give you a visual of what the ball game looked like. Yes. Yes. Well, anyway, it's not loading for me, but you can look at it on your own time and you can learn more about the ball game if you visit this website, um, mesoballgame.org. Um, okay. Oh, did it work? No. I don't know. I think my internet's just acting up right now. Anyway, you can look at it at a later date. Okay. Let's go back to um, Chichen Itza. Okay, I wanna just show you some more images of Chichen Itza. Here's the observatory um, at Chichen Itza. Okay, the last thing I wanna show you um, is, um, are some images from Cholula. This is another site. Yes, Cholula, nice. like the hot nice, yeah. Yes, I know, like the hot <laughs> Oh man, I managed to like yap this whole hour, haven't I? Okay. Um, Cholula is a really interesting place. Um, it's r located right here in the modern day state of Puebla. Um, <coughs> and when you go to Cholula, in fact, the first time I went to Cholula, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, know I was like, is. you know, um, that's an interesting hill. And I was like, it's almost like it's not a hill. And as I looked closer um, and walked around to the other side of it, I realized that this entire thing that looks like a hill that's all overgrown and has a Catholic church on top of it is actually an archeological site, a pyramid. This whole thing is a pyramid. So all of this stuff with trees growing out of it, this is all human made pyramid and you can see the foundations of it down below. So this part has been excavated. The rest of this is not excavated, but it is a human made pyramid. Um, the largest pyramid um, in this part of Mesoamerica at this time, at the time that it's built. And you will see that what the Spaniards did when they arrived is they knocked down the indigenous temple and built a Catholic church on top of the pyramid. So this is literally a Catholic church on top of a pyramid. Uh, and Cholula is known for, in addition to having this massive stone pyramid, um, a painting style, a ceramics painting style is sometimes called the international style. And this is, a, I think, a good way to think about the post-classic period. Um, we call this the international style because it's a mixing of different styles. This um, ceramic style that's popular at Cholula is a mix of local Puebla style and influence from the Mixtec region of Oaxaca, the Mixtec Alta. So the Mixtec people um, and the people of Cholula of Puebla are communicating with each other. And by the way, like to get from Puebla to Oaxaca now, it's like a six hour bus ride. Um, so these people are like traveling long distances, but still communicating with each other, trading objects, um, learning from each other's art styles and influencing each other's art. Um, so this style of ceramics is called the international style. So you can think of like Chichen Itza, Tula, Cholula, um, all of these different sites, the Mishtek sites, as if like they're their own countries, right? So this is why we would call this an international style. So this is what's really popular in the, in the post-classic period, mixing of culture. We looked at Kakashla and we saw the mixing of Maya mural painting styles with um, Teotihuacano iconography. Um, we looked at Chichen Itza and we saw Maya architecture styles mixed with Toltec architecture styles when the Maya region was invaded by Toltec warriors. When we look at Cholula, ceramics from Puebla, we see the mixing of Puebla and Oaxaca styles um, in the ceramics. So this really characterizes um, the post-classic period. 
So I just want to show you um, a few images of um, ceramics from this region. <coughs> okay, the last thing I want to talk about today are the Mishtec people of Oaxaca. I've already sort of introduced you um, to the Mishtec people because we have talked about Oaxaca and we've been to Montelban and we've talked about the Zapotec people. Um, and, and then I also told you that Montelban was later reoccupied by Mishtec people. Do you remember this? Yeah? Okay, somebody, Lisette does. Okay, good. So the Mishtec people um, reuse Montelban and they do some other things. They build their own sites um, and they're really well known throughout Mesoamerica um, as um, great um, stone workers, metalsmiths um, and stone workers. So they're known for working with jade and turquoise um, they're known for their gold objects. And these are the things that we um, saw when we looked at the tomb seven from Montelban. Do you remember? The skull covered in turquoise and all that gold jewelry. So this is one thing that they're known for. They're also really well regarded for their um, books, the codices. Um, and this is what I want to look at um, briefly in the last few minutes today. <clears throat> the Mishtec people call themselves in the Mishtec language, the people of the clouds. Um, and they're known, um, they're living in, um, there's like different Mishtec regions, but the Mishteca Alta, it's like in the highlands. So like kind of in the mountains um, of Oaxaca. So when we were looking at Montelban, that's on a hill in the middle of the valley. And remember that valley of Oaxaca is surrounded by mountains. So the Mishtec people are living mostly up in these mountains, but they do come down and reoccupy. Um, yes, my funeral dream. They reoccupy the valley of Oaxaca. My funeral dream, just to, hey, hey, this, hey, shit is getting real. Shit is getting real. I could die. I could die someday. <laughs> If I die of the coronavirus, will you please do this to my skull? Please, please, please. Take my skull, cover it, thank you. Cover it in turquoise. The turquoise needs to come from the Southwest. Um, yeah, you can put some shell around my teeth. Yeah, you can give me some like, yeah, break the quarantine to go to New Mexico and get my turquoise. I mean, if I die, you know, you, you gotta do some wild shit for me. Put some shell around my mouth, um, shell in my eyes and obsidian to give me pupils to reanimate my skull so I can haunt you for the rest of all time. Actually, if you don't do it, I will haunt you. Fuck it, let's go. <laughs> okay, so this is the Mishtec skull that I've showed you before. This one is actually in the collection of the LA County Museum of Art, which hopefully someday will reopen and you'll be able to see it. Um, I think I showed you this one too. This is in... Um, Santo Domingo in Oaxaca City. Uh, and of course, all of these really amazing gold objects from Tomb 7 um, that I showed you before when we looked at Montelban. Um, and there's another Mishtec site that's really interesting that I want you to um, know about called Mitla, um, which this is like we've come full circle. So we were looking at Kakashla, right? Kakashla was not really a religious site. Um, instead, it's a palace. Mitla is also a palace in the same way. People um, would come here. This is where the nobility would live and nobility would travel to here to hear the great stories, the great epic stories, um, like the imagery from the Codex Nuttall recited um, at these great banquets at Mitla. One thing that I want you to notice on the architecture of Mitla, so this is the facade, like the entrance to one of the buildings of the palace. And you can see all of these geometric designs on the exterior, on the facade. Um, and we think that these um, designs, look at that. So can you see all these repeating designs, but they're different. Each one is unique. We think that these are designs um, that uh, come from textiles. So from, from shawls or fabrics that people wear um, and that represent different groups, different um, indigenous groups from around the Mixtec Alta region. Um, you can also see in this photograph Spaniards doing Spaniards things, which is putting a church on top of a pre-Columbian indigenous site. So can you see these like two little like um, domes back here? 
there's like literally a Spanish church on top of the um, archaeological site at Migla. Um, so here you can see this, this part right here, this whole bottom part all the way up to here is um, indigenous construction. So this is the site of Mitla, the palace. And can you see like the, um, the different abstract designs right here? And then from here up, it's Spanish. It's literally on top of an indigenous site. I was going to ask, like, put a church on top of it. It's like Mitla, like, I was going to ask you, so when I went there, there was, like, big hallways and, like, big rooms, and it looked like a, just, like, a convention of, like, multiple, like, groups, that's why. Yeah, kind of, like, different groups coming together. Yeah. Um, so let me show you um, some close-ups of the um, abstract designs, and then... I mean, they're really cool. Okay, so this is, so here you can see all of these different designs and we think that they're taken from textile designs. So these are contemporary, blow up the church, you know? <laughs> I'm not gonna, extra credit. Um, so these are the textile designs uh, and you can see these abstract designs here. These are modern textiles, but just to give you a sense of like, how art is translated from the textiles onto um, the architecture. And even today, these are all modern photographs, but even today, like the different parts of Oaxaca and different indigenous groups have really different textile designs, right? So um, these women are wearing like the textile designs from the villages that they're from. Um, so we think that at Mitla, all of these different indigenous groups were coming together and meeting here um, and kind of, I don't know, you could think of it like the United Nations or something, right? Have, like, you know, at the UN, there's like all the different flags of all the different countries. But this is kind of like that. It's like the different um, designs from textiles from all the different indigenous groups coming together at Mitla. And at, here's a close up of one of the designs. So you can see that like, the design is like actually like the, the stones are cut into these shapes and then placed in like it's really um, it's really quite artfully done. It's like really impressive um, designs here uh, on the facade uh, of Mitla. Here's an interior shot of one of the rooms. Um, so you can see the designs carry also on the interior. Um, and this is where like, you know, people would be feasting, having um, like listening to a speaker, like spending time together and being surrounded by this imagery that represents all these kind of different nations. <clears throat> so these are just contemporary images of like regional dress <clears throat> in Oaxaca. So you can see that like, these are all Oaxacan designs. So you can see that within the state of Oaxaca, there's like a great deal of diversity. Um, and we see that kind of represented uh, here in the architecture at Mitla. There are also some murals at Mitla, but they're very damaged, so they're not in um, much of a, a state to look at. Um, and the last thing that we would look at with the Bishkek people um, is we would look at the codices. So actually, we got a couple minutes. Um, let me open this other slideshow. Um, and you have already looked at some of these images before. Um, when we, can somebody put mute? Um, thank you. Um, I, I love to hear your family members in the background. <laughs> Um, okay, so we've seen <clears throat> this imagery before because we've looked at we've looked at the writing and the calendar system, and you learned how to read, um, right? So you can see like this figure right here. What's this figure's name? Eleven death. Yeah, death. But remember, you have to count the numbers. Okay, so here is Lord Eleven Death, accompanied by one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, Lord Nine. What is that? Serpent? Do you think that's serpent or Alec crocodile? Mm, no, that's um, that's serpent though. That's serpent, one hundred percent. That's serpent. Anyway, serpent yeah. or crocodile? Um, Eleven Death. This one's water. How many little dots are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and Lord Nine Water. 
So you can see um, these figures are named and they're on these canoes um, and they're dressed for battle. They're wearing their headdresses. Um, they've got their, you know, weapons drawn. They've got shields and spears and the little like little dart thrower things. And they're going off to conquer some places. And you can see that they have conquered this place, right? And there's this reed that's stabbing into this hill, right? <clears throat> Somebody asked, is there a reason why some have multicolor for their name? And no, we don't know. That's a good question. Um, that's the kind of question um, that you would try to answer with like a research paper. So that could be a research project that you do for this class. When I was in grad school and I was looking at these um, codices, the thing that I was really interested in were like the, the hand gestures and the hand positioning of the figures. And so I did a study where I looked at um, all of the hand gestures in the Codex Nuttall and I compared them to um, Native American hand signs um, and I came up with nothing. So my conclusion is I still don't know. The hand signs probably mean Lincoln, but I haven't been able to figure them out. Um, but so as far as I know, the colors don't mean anything, but I could be wrong. There could be a reason, um, but that would be something that would take further study. Um, so that's something that your group project can be about if you want to study that further. Do we discuss what? Oh, did we discuss the um, the discussion that you, were you assigned? I, I'll, I'll tell you at the end, but I did talk about it on Wednesday. Oh, oh, sorry about that. That's okay. I just want to show you um, a few. I'll, I'll, I'll address that in one minute. I just want you to look through this um, PowerPoint. Um, I want you to look at um, these images from the codices. You already know the day signs. Um, you already know the year signs, so you can read like who is depicted um, in these images. These are some place signs that I don't think I introduced you to yet. I did show you, <coughs> this, um, but now you see plain and town. And you'll, so a plain is like a field of grass. Um, so I want you to look through this um, and sort of practice kind of reading some of these images. Yeah? So this is, I don't have time to do this. So I want you to do this um, on your own. Look through all of this. Oh, the one thing I want to tell you is that in this image, in the Codex Nettle, this guy gets stabbed. Can you see him getting stabbed? In a Temescal, which is like this kind of sweat lodge kind of place. Um, so can you see this like triangle thing of fire right here? Yeah. You can see it right there. Do you see this? This little triangle thing and then there's like smoke coming out of it that's indicating that they're in the Temescal. Um, so this guy gets stabbed in the Temescal and then Lord Eight Deer tries to avenge like the murderer and it's really like a telenovela of people stabbing each other in the back. Um, it's, and, and like murdering each other and like political intrigue and you know um, like long lost cousins coming back to life and everything. So it's a really interesting story. So I want you to look through um, this slideshow. Uh, okay, so let's talk about, um, what did you ask me? Somebody just asked me something about the discussion forum. Yeah, that was me. Is this Renaissance to Modern? What? No, Mexican art. Oh my gosh, I came out too early. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry about that. Come back at 2.30. Okay, bye. Okay, um, discussion forum. Anybody else have any questions? That That's okay. Person was in the wrong class. Um, it's like being in the wrong classroom. Uh, so basically what you're going to see, let me see if I can share this screen with you. Okay. But basically what you're going to see is there's going to be um, discussion forums on here and it's going to say like, you know, answer this question um, and it'll be pretty self-explanatory. You'll just type in your answer and that's it. Cool. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, the group project. Does anybody have any questions about the collaborative project? It's still going forward. Um, the people who were in class on Wednesday already paired up. So if you were not in class on Wednesday, um, you should, type in the chat thing and try to find some other people to pair up with um, for 
uh, the collaborative project. So you can literally type your name and be like, hi, I'm, I'm Maria, I need a partner or something. And you can like kind of group together there. How many people are supposed to be? Um, about four people, I think is a good number for the research project. Let me, I'm going to look at the chat. Um, I want you guys, you all to like make your own groups if you um, weren't here Wednesday. And I'm going to look at the chat and see if there are any questions that um, people want me to answer before I go. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so Kermit. <laughs> Did you see the thing that um Alma posted? Who? Alma posted a thing of like um the uh I forgot, I forgot that I can do this. This is funny. We had enough room to go up to two thousand twelve. Yeah, oh, I remember. Oh my oh, god, that's, I mm. that's funny. In Mexico, um, actually, everyone was like, Yeah, that's just the calendar, though. And then we just, oh, the rest of the exactly. Was and also, time is cyclical, so yeah, it's it was like a new cycle. Yeah, exactly. that, that's the end of, the the cycle. End of yeah. one cycle, the beginning of another cycle, just like when we went from 1999 to 2000. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. okay, so let's see. Anybody had any questions? Wait, I have one. Uh-huh. Hi. <laughs> so for a virtual exhibition design and cur curatorial statement paper assignment. You came on the, if you came on the field trip, you don't have to do that. Oh, really? Okay. That, um, that replaces the field trip. Okay, got it, got it. Sorry. Whoa, I was gonna do it. <laughs> Good thing you didn't. So Wait, what thing we're not supposed to do it again? Sorry. Friendly reminder that the museum, the museum. If you look under assignments. Oh yeah, I didn't get to get to you in person, like in the paper. So I actually have to. I think so. So um, museum paper assignment. If you went on the field trip, you do not have to do this. Okay. Oh, wait, 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 but like if we didn't give you like the paper though. If you did not submit your papers to me, you need to submit it here on Canvas. Did you get Okay. Because I, I know I think I sent it through Canvas and email. Um, you don't email it to me, post it in Canvas. But did you get it on Canvas though? I don't know. Um, I can look. It looks like I have three people who submitted to Canvas. Um, let me, I don't real, know. Real quick question. So do we just like put, put it like in a discussion or like do we like send it to you like on the inbox or? No, you post it here in the assignment. Oh, okay, in the assignment, okay. In just, the like, assignment. The picture of it? Okay. Well, you can type it, you can scan it. Okay. Um, mm. Thank you. Yeah, does that answer your questions? Yes. Okay, everybody liked the mural from Kakashla. <laughs> yeah. I heard you like pyramids, so we put a pyramid in your pyramid. <laughs> you guys are funny. Okay. Uh, so any questions? I'm trying to see. What held the turquoise onto the skull? Oh, that's a good question. I don't probably some kind of like mortar. So we know that they made mortar for buildings, so they probably used something similar. Um, that was used when they were like, um, they would burn wood and then they would put limestone in the fire um, and some remnants from that would make this kind of sticky glue mortar stuff. So that's probably what held the turquoise onto the skull. Somebody asked if they could go to the bathroom, yes. Um, how many people to a group? About four people. Did you group yourselves? Looks like you did. Okay. Yes, you can join a group of four. If you want to have five in a group, that's fine, but try not to do um, more than that. 
Okay, so in, in the chat, you can group with each other. And I want you, once you're in a group, I want you to like get the contact information of your group members um, so that you can collaborate via email or text or whatever. Okay, cool. All right, so this is only gonna happen on Mondays. So Monday, I'll do a little lecture like this. I'll answer any questions. Um, and then Wednesday, I'll, I'll have a, a discussion forum where like I post a question and then you answer it. Um, and that is going to be for your, to replace your grade for exams. Cool? Yep. Questions? No. <laughs> Any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to peace out. Uh, <laughs> I got to go to my next class. Uh, yeah, we're good. All right, do this. <laughs> okay, so make sure you connect with your group members. Um, it's not due until later in the semester, um, but you're still going to have to do it. Oh, and by the way, um, it's in the form of a video that's no longer than 10 minutes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Do I have examples? Good question. Yes, I do have examples um, on my YouTube channel, which I'll post a link to. Um, I have to update the assignment on Canvas because right now it still says like, um, actually, I don't even know what it says. Mm, it, I don't have that much information on here. So I will put the information on here and I will put a link to my YouTube, which you can look at. I'll put this link here, but it's anyway, if you go to, I have different playlists. Where do I, let's see. On my YouTube channel, I have playlists. I know. Can you see my screen? No, let me share my screen. Sorry, I turned it off. If you go to my YouTube channel, I have playlists um, and here's the Mexican art history one. So um, these are sample student videos. Um, so the, you can watch these if you wanna see examples, okay? Yeah? Cool. Cool. Okay, anything else? Type of the names of the books. You mean these books? Well, what you, sh these specific books? What you should do is once you get a topic, um, you can, you can, I'm, I'm gonna post this video. Um, once you get a topic, you can email me and I can recommend, like I can see if I have any specific books that I can lend you. Um, and, um, you know, I can look in my library and see what I have that I could lend you once you like choose your topic. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, I will update Canvas soon and I will see you next Monday here. Yeah. Um, yes. And be on the lookout for the uh, discussion question that's going to be coming soon. Right. Cool? Yeah. Okay. Bye. 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 I miss you. It's weird. <laughs> I hope I see you again someday in real life. Have a good week. You too. Bye. Bye.